the new year at Cape Kennedy promises to be one of the most ambitious in its history. There will be new space probes, a new powerful booster, and man will again orbit the Earth. The nation's new man in space program, Project Gemini, succeeds Mercury, which ended in 1963. A launch scheduled for early 1965 will send the astronaut team of Gus Grissom and John Young into a planned three-orbit, five-hour flight. The first two flights in Gemini were unmanned tests. The first, on April 8, 1964, was an orbital mission. The second flight, on January 19th this year, was a grueling suborbital reentry test at speeds considerably higher than a normal manned orbital flight. A combined military industry team headed by Lieutenant Colonel John G. Albert launches the Titan booster for NASA. The successful flight and recovery of the unmanned Gemini capsule paved the way for the first two-man space flight, one of a planned series of 10 launches, which will ultimately send a pair of astronauts into space on flights lasting up to two weeks. The Navy, one of the Eastern Test Range's most active users, launched four of its 2,500-mile range Polaris A3 missiles in the January-February time period. The nuclear submarines, in tests of ship, crew, and missile, conduct these launches while submerged approximately 30 miles off the Cape. The A3 Polaris attained operational status in mid-1964 and is now on active station with the Navy's alert forces. On January 22nd, Goddard Space Technicians prepared a three-stage Thor Delta rocket for an unusual flight. Its mission? Place a new version of the Tyros weather satellite into circular polar orbit 460 miles above the Earth. The flight, a forerunner of a joint NASA-US Weather Bureau program, will permit photographing the entire sunlit portion of the Earth daily. To accomplish this, three precise, complicated space maneuvers would be necessary. The difficult orbit required that the rocket be programmed to fly south over populated areas, the first such flight from Cape Kennedy. The boost and guidance phase of the flight was normal. However, a command signal from Earth failed to shut off the second stage, resulting in longer powered flight and a higher than planned orbit. The satellite, however, will still provide valuable information for weather analysis. In the early morning hours of January 28th, the Blue Scout, a four-stage solid-fueled rocket, was made ready for flight. The Scout, a standardized launch vehicle, economical and versatile, is used in subsystem development and scientific experiments in the upper atmosphere. January's flight carried a 33-pound payload and was programmed to reach an altitude of 21,000 miles. Mission objectives were to learn more of the Earth's magnetic field and how it is affected by the sun's radiations. With all pre-flight checks completed, the blockhouse crew launched the Blue Scout rocket at 7.51 a.m. After 100 seconds of flight, a malfunction developed in the second stage which ultimately caused the experiment to fall short of its goal. The payload followed a course parallel to the intended flight path and re-entered the atmosphere, impacting in the Atlantic Ocean southwest of Ascension Island. In its earlier days, Cape Kennedy figured primarily as a proving ground for the development of rocket and missile systems for national defense. Although overshadowed today by the more glamorous projects of space exploration, Weapons research and development continues. On January 28th, 
members of the 6555th Aerospace Test Wing successfully launched Minuteman 2 from an underground silo on Complex 31. The test was the fifth success in as many tries for the advanced 7,000 mile range Minuteman, which is being deployed in underground launch silos with Strategic Air Command. This flight successfully placed its instrumented payload into the planned target area near Ascension Island in the South Atlantic. On February 3rd, OSO-2 was successfully launched into a 350-mile high orbit. OSO, short for Orbiting Solar Observatory, roared into space atop a three-stage Thor Delta rocket. The satellite's sensitive instruments were designed to measure the sphere of hot gases around the sun and learn more about the effects of the sun's thermonuclear radiation on Earth and other planets. OSO-2 is the second of eight similar satellites planned throughout an 11-year solar cycle to study the astrophysical phenomena of Earth's nearest star. On February 11th, a major first in orbital mechanics was achieved. On Launch Stand 20, a Titan 3A core vehicle stood poised, awaiting a crucial test. Its third stage would stop, restart, and maneuver in space three times, placing itself and a satellite in three different orbits. For the first time in the Titan 3 program, an active experimental satellite was included as part of the mission. The program is under direction of Space Systems Division of the Air Force Systems Command. Titan's guidance system maneuvered it to a trajectory designed to place the trans-stage and payload into a circular orbit 100 miles high. From this parking orbit, at various intervals, the trans-stage executed four intricate orbital maneuvers in space, which finally placed the vehicle in a 1,500 mile high orbit and successfully ejected the bonus payload. An impressive space score for the Titan III system. While Titan 3A was being flight tested, the Titan 3C program moved ahead. Flight hardware for the huge solid fuel boosters arrived for checkout. When assembled, the 120 inch solid fuel segments will produce a booster with one million pounds of thrust. Two boosters attached to the core vehicle will produce the free world's most powerful and versatile rocket. The first Titan 3C flight is tentatively scheduled for the latter part of May 1965. The huge booster rocket's exhaust nozzles with its precision hydraulically operated guidance devices went through rigorous checkouts before attachment to the booster. A continuing assurance of reliability standards for the powerful rocket which will be America's newest man-rated system. To learn more about the tiny meteoroids that streak through space at speeds up to 45 miles per second, NASA in February prepared a giant winged satellite for a unique mission in space. When placed in orbit by the Saturn rocket, the Pegasus spacecraft, named after the winged monster of mythology, will spread its 96-foot wings to measure and count the dust particles in space. Impacts are counted by an interruption of an electrical charge on the aluminum foil surface of the wings. Pegasus is expected to provide valuable information for the design of meteoroid shielding for the manned Apollo spacecraft. The huge Saturn rocket with an Apollo spacecraft and the winged satellite aboard was prepared for launch. This Saturn flight was the eighth 
straight success for the mighty rocket. As launch time drew close, gantry removal began. In the blockhouse, launch technicians monitored the involved complex countdown. All systems must be verified ready. All the weeks of careful preparation are for this day and for this time. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Pegasus payload was propelled into an orbit ranging from 308 to 458 miles high and is successfully transmitting important data on the density, size, and speed of space dust particles. Space flight has presented man with history's most challenging problems. Powerful rockets must be developed. He must bring with him an environment if he is to survive. He must develop a means of returning safely to Earth. Part of the national effort to solve these problems included the Air Force Asset Research Program, a program to obtain knowledge for the design of future manned spacecraft able to withstand the searing heat of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. This was the last in a series of six flights for the Delta Wing spacecraft of aerodynamic design. The flight that started at 9.36 a.m on the 23rd of February, successfully ended the asset research program. On February 23rd, Vice President Hubert Humphrey arrived at Cape Kennedy for his first visit to the nation's spaceport. In his executive role, He's the chairman of the National Aeronautics and Space Council. During the six-hour tour, he visited all of the major facilities of the Cape and Merritt Island launch area. General Houston, commander of the Air Force Eastern Test Range, and Dr. Kurt Debus, director of NASA's Kennedy Space Center, accompanied the vice president on the tour. A highlight of the tour was his visit to Complex 19 and briefing by Lieutenant Colonel John G. Albert on Project Gemini. The vice presidential party also toured the White Room during their stop for a close look at the spacecraft. At Complex 37, Lieutenant Colonel Rocco Patron briefed the vice president on the Apollo program with models of the Saturn V launch vehicle, which will eventually send three astronauts on a lunar landing mission. The last stop of the day was at the Air Force Titan III complex. He was briefed by Generals Blameyer and Evans of Space Systems Division on the versatility and numerous capabilities of this new concept in rocketry using a combination of solid and liquid fuel motors as a launch system. Before his departure, the Vice President said of the space program, my only regret is that we didn't start sooner. In mid-February, preparations for another lunar photographic mission were well underway. Ranger 8, with six TV cameras, consisting of two wide-angle and four narrow-angle cameras, would electronically relay photographs of the lunar surface. Like its predecessor, it was carefully checked, tested, and assembled under ultra-clean conditions. Launch day preparations on the Atlas Agena vehicle for Ranger 8 was a smooth, uninterrupted flow of planned events. The Atlas booster, originally designed to serve the nation as a military weapon, has gradually changed roles and is now a reliable booster for deep space probes and interplanetary missions. At T-130 minutes in the count, 
the service tower was removed to clear the way for launch. Ranger's primary target was an area close to the shadow line on the third quarter moon. This lighting angle would enable its TV cameras to produce pictures with more contrast and detail. At 12.05 p.m., the Atlas Agena rocket roared from its launch pad. After 12 minutes of flight, the 808-pound spacecraft was placed into a 115-mile-high parking orbit. Eight minutes later, the Agena stage propelled Ranger on its path to the moon. Approximately 65 hours after launch from Cape Kennedy and 23 minutes before impact, Ranger 8 began transmitting thousands of exceptionally clear photographs back to Earth receiving stations. These remarkable pictures from Ranger's electronic eyes are thousands of times better than the best lunar photographs taken with Earth-bound telescopes. They revealed surface variations not shown in the previous Ranger mission. At an altitude of 270 miles above the moon, this picture, recorded four minutes before impact, gave scientists a close view of parallel rills on the lunar surface. 27 and one-half miles above the moon, and 25 seconds before its mission ended, Ranger recorded an area six and one-half miles wide and four and one-half miles long. 12,000 feet and approximately two seconds from impact, the spacecraft recorded the last of over 7,000 pictures, pictures that will contribute to man's knowledge of the lunar surface. Ranger 8 was another step forward in our nation's efforts to land American astronauts on the moon in this decade.